thank you for coming for this uh, late um, uh, panel discussion with uh, our guest Didier Ribon. Uh, we are going to present uh, the, his book that is just uh, came out of the print a few days ago into creation, which is translated by Milena Ostoic. And uh, we put a quite provocative title of this discussion, which is, um, is it time for a class coming out, you know? So we'll see how uh, DJ will respond uh, to, to these questions. First, we'll uh, have a discussion uh, between three of us, like 45 minutes, and then we'll, we will leave some space for you for the questions from the public. So uh, uh, the book is uh, actually written 10 years ago, and uh, it seems uh, the interest for it, uh, it's never stopped, actually. And uh, after these 10 years, uh, would you did yeah, uh, actually make some changes to the book? Uh, did you change some perspective after, uh, in these 10 years? And we know also you are writing kind of uh, uh, new, the second volume of the book. And uh, is the second volume kind of a correction of the first, or is it just a natural sequel? I don't know yet because I'm writing it, and uh, I'll I answer next year <laughs> when uh, it it um, it will be finished. And um, the book has been written, has been published in French, uh, the first edition in 2009. So in October 2009, so 10 years ago, uh, indeed. And would would I have to write it? Today, uh, what would I would like to change? I, I don't know because part of the book is uh, uh, is the the history of my family, the history of of my childhood, the the history of the French uh, uh, working class, and um, the French uh, the history of French politics, and uh, especially on the left and the, the, the importance, uh, the prominence of the Communist Party in the working class milieu in which I, I was born and in which I, I was uh, raised. And um, this, I, of course, if I had to write the book today, uh, this would be the, the, the exactly the same story that, that I would have to tell. But the, it's not an atom autobiography. It's, uh, when I published it, it was not intended as a book, uh, an autobiography. It was, in my view, in, for me, it was um, a book of um, um, uh, sociological investigation, historical investigation, and a book of uh, um, uh, on philosophical uh, um, 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 Political philosophy and uh, theoretical reflection. So I, I never consider when I see in Germany that the book is is, is labeled uh, Didier Eribon's novel. And not only it's not a novel, but it's not even, uh, in my view, uh, an, an autobiography. But now, if people want to read it as a novel. Uh, uh, I have no objection to that, uh, and uh, if they want to read it as an autobiography, I, don't, I do not object uh, either. But what I, w the, the the two central chapters uh, in the book were um, devoted to an analysis of the transformation of uh, the vote of the, how do uh, does the working class. Uh, in France, vote. Uh, um, how, the, they were, uh, how they shift part of them, no, of course, it, uh, yeah. when you write, you, you can uh, nuance your, your uh, discourse, but when you speak, it's, it's, it's uh, less uh, easy. Uh, part of the working class, uh, large part of the working class in France, started to vote for the National Front, so the far right wing, uh, um, in the mid 1980s, in the 1990s, and in the 2000s, and um, so what we could have 
we could have think of this phenomenon as a temporary phenomenon. And on the contrary, uh, we saw that phenomenon more and more important. And uh, parts, um, um, sectors um, of the working class uh, voting more and more for the far right wing. And uh, up to uh, in certain parts of France, north of France, which were left wing strongholds, socialist or communist strongholds in the 60s, 70s, 80s, where the candidates, some candidates of the, uh, at the, uh, the election for the uh, member of the parliament, uh, some, the communist candidate could be elected on the first round with more than 50% of the vote. And now this uh, constituency, this, this district, has turned to the National Front with the same uh, level of vote, 50%, uh, 60%. Some, in some, uh, Edouard Louis, uh, Edouard Louis who is, uh, is uh, somewhere, I don't know where, uh, uh, in the village in which uh, he was born, and the village in, in which he, uh, he the, the village he described in his book, uh, 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 En finir avec Eddie Belgueul, the end of Eddie in, uh, in English. Um, the, um, it's up to 60% percent and, uh, for the National Front. So not only what I described was true, but it is more and more so uh, year after year. And I would have to maybe to reconsider some, some part of the analysis I, I gave in the book because I was describing how what does it what does it what did it mean to vote for the communist party in the 60s or 70s in my family for example my, my family people were very proud to vote for the communist party it was a way of giving themselves a dignity a pride an identity a positive identity they were building themselves as the working class with a w, uh, uh, capital W, uh, as uh, uh, the working class movement, as the, um, as, uh, um, the workers, as the, as the left, through the vote for a party, which in, in my family, people did not say the communist party, they say le parti, the party. And so it was a kind of identification to a cult political culture, to a political party, which gave them uh, a, 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 a sense of belonging to a group, to, to a class. The, the working class did exist because there was a party uh, which were claiming we are the party of the working class. And through the vote to this party, which were claiming, uh, presenting, uh, uh, describing itself as a, the party of the working class, party of the workers, workers did give themselves an identity and they were proud of that it was, it, 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 it was a positive vote it, it, was, it, 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 it was not only oppositional it was giving to, to give oneself an identity political and social identity and what I describe in my book when I when I realized that my family was now in the um, um, 90s and uh, um, have started voting for the National Front. My family were supporters of the Communist Party. I tried to understand. And when I asked my mother, did you vote for Jean-Marie Le Pen? Say, oh, no, 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 I did not. Are you sure? No, I tell you I did not. Um, I'm sure you did. Oh, okay, I did once. I, once only? Oh, maybe. So it was she was ashamed of having voted for the, uh, the, the far right wing. So it was exactly the opposite. It, she did not uh, feel very proud of having voted for the National Front. She did not feel very happy. It, it did not give her a political identity because she was lying about that, at least to me. So, I describe this, the, the difference between the two 
way of voting for the Communist Party, the, the same people voting for uh, uh, National Front 20 years uh, after. But my brother, my younger brothers, vote for the National Front and are very happy to do so. And uh, they consider that there is nothing else they can do. They, they don't imagine that they could vote for the left. And I, more and more, um, the last polls in France, the, 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 the figures are frightening because you see that the National Front is the first party among the younger voters, which means that what I described as a sh vote, um, people were ashamed of, uh, of uh, doing, of uh, something people were ashamed of doing. Now there are younger people who identify themselves as far right wing voters, exactly the same way as my parents did for when they did vote for the Communist Party. So maybe I would have to add at least some, some pages or maybe one, one chapter about that, that the transformation. It takes time for a vote to change, for the working class to stop voting for the left and progressively, step by step, to vote for the far right wing. But when the habit of voting for a party when you used when it is the party for which you vote. It's like an, as natural uh, as uh, it, so. It took time. It took thirty years, and I'm afraid. It, I don't say that that cannot um, move back to the in the other way, but I'm afraid it it will take. Uh, um, at least several years, and uh, which is uh, frightening. And I'm talking now about France, but uh, when my book was uh, uh, translated into German a few years ago, it was exactly at the moment where, uh, when the far right wing was getting a uh, high level of, uh, of uh, uh, high percentage of votes, and um, they, they, they found into my book um, an analysis, a grid of analysis to understand what was at stake in their country. And I was invited a lot of time, and people please tell us what we have to do uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, stop this movement. Oh my God, if I, if I knew, uh, I would be very happy to tell you, but unfortunately, I don't, I don't know even in my own country, so I cannot tell you. But there is something which is similar in France and Germany. I, I, I don't, uh, this is my first time in, in Croatia and in Zagreb, though I, I, I will not uh, risk uh, to, to, to say silly things about your country, you, you know it better, than, of course, than I do. And, uh, uh, but I know France and, and Germany and Great Britain. What I realize is the, the, com the complete erasure of the issue of class. Uh, how the, the left-wing parties, social democrats, uh, social de democratic party parties, uh, party socialist in France, SPD in Germany, Labour, New Labour in Great Britain, betrayed the working class. Be betrayed what the, what it meant to be left wing. What what were the definition of of the left, which which was to to be on the side of the workers of the of the the the, the poor people, and this, this was not only a political gesture, economic gesture, not to, to take into account anymore the workers, but it was also an intellectual uh, shift to erase completely from the discourse of the left, the left wing, the, the very notion of class and the class struggle, uh, and, uh, not even class struggle, uh, uh, as far as the very notion of class. There is no such thing as social classes. They are only individuals. It was a way to put the blame of individual. If you f do not succeed in life, it's not because you're poor and your parents are poor. It's because of your 
own individual responsibility. And this neoliberal discourse linked to an economic neoliberal agenda uh, pushed the, the, the leaders of the left and the, 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 the previously left-wing intellectual moving to the right, pushed them to completely uh, dismantle the uh, left-wing intellectual framework and especially the, uh, to, uh, to reject completely, to erase completely the notion of class. And if you don't speak about class, and you think and you tell people there is no such thing as social classes, there is no class in society, you do not, the, the social classes will not disappear. They disappear from the discourses, but not from the reality. And people that, to which you deny the, the possibility to identify themselves as member of a social class, uh, the workers, the working class, will reconstitute themselves as a group which has been dismantled by the neoliberal uh, discourse. They will reconstitute as a group, not considering themselves as a class, but as, as a group. Uh, and the, the we, we the workers, we the working class, I have been uh, 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 hearing every day in my life when I, I was a child, now the same people or their children or grandchildren, we, the workers, not again the bourgeoisie, not again the exploiters, but again the, we, the French, again the migrants, or in Germany with the German. So it's, uh, we is not a class, it's a nation or nationalist, uh, nationalist uh, feeling, and uh, nationalist way of identifying against migrants and against the elites which are supporting the uh, entrance of migrants in our country. So here, the Social Democratic Party, by, because they, they erase the notion of class, are responsible of uh, what is happening in European countries today? It was a long answer to your, to your question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good evening and thank you to, for being with us tonight. Uh, uh, this uh, shame, uh, feeling of shame figures prominently in your work and um, especially in uh, Retour à Reims, uh, it, it, it is about uh, gay shame, and uh, when you cite Eve Kosovsky Sedgwick, who says that childhood shame has a near inexhaustible, is near inexhaustible source of transformational energy, and um, in a sense, uh, when you talk about this class shame and the shame of being ashamed as a, as a mode of social control and, and the function of oppression, uh, can, you, can we maybe imagine uh, some sort of class politics of shame as it is uh, with, uh, uh, for instance, um, I mean, uh, the, the, the feeling of shame is, is something that is perceived and experienced very individually, and it, it tends uh, further to isolate individuals and by its very nature, and it tends to even deprive them of, of language with which to describe the violence that happens to them, and describe their social condition. And some class politics of shame would need to take up that question collectively, right? And can we em envision something like that? Well, shame is, um, I wrote extensively about shame, and shame is a very, very complex uh, feeling. It's not one feeling, it's a, uh, it's a mix of feeling, uh, uh, several layers of, uh, of feeling. And I first experienced shame as a gay teenager, um, not, not quite sure of what I was becoming, but uh, scared of, uh, uh, when I was 15 or 16, scared of what I, 
I was becoming gay. There is a beautiful uh, poem by Allen Ginsberg in which he, he mentioned with the, what he called the scared gay kid. And I was at that time this scared gay kid. Uh, I was scared of becoming gay. And, uh, and because it, it was something you have to, uh, to be ashamed of at that time. You, uh, the, the whole social order was inscribing shame in your mind, in your body, in your, uh, in your feelings, in your life. If you were gay or lesbian or, or uh, dissenting from the uh, uh, sexual uh, normality, and um, normativity at least. Uh, at that time it was, when I try to, su to surpass this feeling of shame, uh, I have to leave my uh, working class milieu, which was a very, very homophobic uh, milieu, and I, I left uh, the city of Reims to live in Paris, to, to, to be gay, to, to become gay more freely and more happily. And, and, and at that time, I met different people. I, uh, uh, um, it was, um, I was not any, anymore the son of a working class family, but I was a young uh, student and then a young intellectual. And I became ashamed of my family, of my uh, working class background in the new, uh, bourgeois or uh, um, the, the, the uh, cult cultural bourgeoisie, uh, intellectual bourgeoisie. I was ashamed of my... So it was, again, shame, but a complete different shame, a level of shame. And at, at that time, um, I had to, to deal with these two conflicting uh, identity. I was the son of a working class. I was gay, and the two, uh, the, 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 these two identities did not fit very well together. And when my father died, I realized that uh, the reason why I escaped from my, uh, from Reims, from my, uh, um, from my social milieu, was not only because they were homophobic. Which they were. Uh, it was. Uh, it was uh, true. Uh, uh, but it was also because they were working class. And I started re reflecting: What does that mean to be ashamed of um, one social background? Uh, to be ashamed of of, uh, of uh, being the son of a working class family? And um, I. I try to reflect on the similarity and the differences between to be ashamed of uh, being gay when I was a teenager and being ashamed of being working uh, the, this, uh, of my social background when I, when I was not anymore a teenager. So uh, I try to reflect on that. And this is the, uh, the, the, the starting point of the book, uh, Returning to Reims. I, I am retour à Reims in French. I, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce it in, uh, in Croatian. Uh, my accent would be horrible. And um, uh, it is in English, but it would be <laughs> more, more horrible in, uh, in, in Croatian. And I, to answer your question, the, we can say that the LGBT movement um, has been grounded on the feeling of pride to, came, to, to forget, to uh, uh, surpass the feeling of shame. Uh, uh, exactly like the anti-racist movement, black is beautiful, or gay is beautiful, gay pride, and so on. So it's, it's, um, it's to use the feeling of shame as a transformative weapon, uh, uh, feeling uh, as if Kosovsky Sedgwick put it in a wonderful way, shame as a transformative energy. A, a, a wonderful transformative energy because you have to do something of yourself. I don't know if you, if you can transfer that analysis of uh, shame as transformative energy to the working class because shame doesn't function in the same way um, my 
my parents did not experience shame in the same way that I did, uh, because of course they were confronted to the social violence, to the social hierarchies. Uh, um, they did not read books, so in some situations they felt ashamed. But shame was only um, uh, in t uh, an intermittent uh, feeling, and maybe we can. Uh, but there, there, there was also, as I put it previously, um, the possibility of being proud of oneself through the political identification to uh, the working class, to the, the Communist Party, and so on. If this does not exist anymore, how do people who feel inferiorized, stigmatized, uh, oppressed, how can they feel proud of what they are, and they don't. And if you see now in France the, this uh, uh, very, very uh, strange and complex movement, which is, uh, they, they call them, them the, the yellow vest, uh, here you have people who, what they, they fight the police uh, uh, in the streets, they are uh, subjected to, sub to, to, to an incredible level of uh, police violence and police repression, which is, to, today, France is one of the less democratic country in Europe, and uh, um, the authoritarian government, which is its police repression against demonstrators, uh, and rid of them have been mutilated by the police weapons, uh, 25 of the demonstrators have, have lost an eye, five have lost a hand, uh, and hundreds have been mutilated, hundreds have been sent to jail. It's, it's an, a level of repression that you cannot understand in a democrat, democratic country. Emmanuel Macron is probably the most conservative, the most authoritarian, uh, the most uh, repressive uh, 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 modes of governmentality we, we can see in Europe uh, today. And uh, I don't know another country in Europe where people are mutilated in the streets uh, every week, uh, losing their eyes and so on. It's, it's incredible, incredible and, and infuriating and disgusting. But I would say if those people dare to get back to the street week after week, uh, confronting uh, police violence, uh, not, not afraid of being uh, subjected to this uh, police violence and police repression, which means that what is at stake here is a sense of dignity. What they want is to be taken in account. It's not only because they cannot uh, uh, feed their children at the end of the month. It's, it's, it's true, they cannot. So they are infuriated and they want to protest against that. But it's, it would not be sufficient. It would not be, it, it's not enough to understand why thousands, dozens of thousands of people can go to the streets week after week, every Saturday, in spite of the tear gas, in spite of the uh, rubber bullets, in spite of everything. And I, I, I went to demonstration and I saw that. Uh, it's, it's really scary. And these people are not scared to do that. They go to the demonstration, they fight the police. They, so here, maybe this is a politic of shame. They don't want to be um, uh, considered as people who are bound to be ashamed of what they are, and they are reclaiming some dignity to be to be recognized as a, as a citizen, as political subjects, as people who count in the country. And here, maybe your question about shame: maybe they are not ashamed of what they are uh, when they are collectively demonstrating in the street with the yellow vest. Yellow vest, you know, is, a, the, is a, something you wear, as you know, when you, um, because you, you, you have that in your car, when you are in danger, 
and you have to be visible in the street. And this is what the yellow vest means, to be visible when you are in danger, when you, are, when you need to be visible. And the yellow vests are demonstrating collectively together to be visible because they are in danger and they don't want to be in danger anymore. So it's kind of passion of, uh, of uh, they are infuriated they, 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 and they build themselves. I know there are some silly discourses. I, I don't share every word that uh, they, they, they speak or, or don't, but they, in this confrontation between um, precarious workers, uh, uh, unemployed, poor workers, and, and the state police, the state violence, the state institution, you have something which is uh, about dignity, so about they don't want to be ashamed of what they are. Uh, so they, they, they fight the police. Uh, <clears throat> the idea in your book, uh, in some places, um, you oppose uh, uh, to Id your identities uh, being homosexual and then uh, uh, to have uh, this uh, class origin, worker class origin, and particularly this, uh, since you were reluctant to come to return to Rams uh, earlier, uh, it was probably this class shame that was uh, hindering you from 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 coming back. Uh, can you uh, can you compare these two shames? You know, shame of coming from the lower classes, which are very often conservative, etc., homophobic, etc., and uh, this uh, becoming of homosexual subject. Let's say. Um, there is something in your question which, which we have to reflect on. It's, that means that there are several forms of domination, several modes of domination. Uh, there is not one mode of domination, the social or economic one. There are several. You can be uh, inferiorized as belonging to the working class. As, uh, you can be inferiorized um, uh, as uh, gay or lesbian, you can be inferior as, as black, or you can be inferior, inferior as in so many ways. So there are different modes of domination. And when I get back to Reims, uh, retour à Reims, uh, return à Reims, when I, when I return to Reims, uh, it, it, in the idea of return, returning means that uh, you you are somewhere else, and you have to go back where you you did belong before. So, um, and the the, the 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 it's not that easy to return. The, it's what's the what was the difficulty of the book to write the book to to return is not an easy process, and um, and it is an endless uh, process. It's it's not over, and. Uh, uh, and it cannot be uh, finished. And when when I return to Reims, I uh, I reflect on why did my parents start to vote for the National Front? What uh, is for them? What does it mean for them to be working class? What has been uh, kind of politics they uh, they felt uh, betrayed by? And um, I realized that we have to revive the, the uh, left-wing framework in which the notion of class would be uh, central. But I, I know that in Germany, my book has been read by some uh, people, um, Zara Wagenknecht uh, um, quoted my book in the, in the Bundestag, uh, and then uh, she, she took from my book the idea that we have to get rid of I, what she called identity politics, uh, f um, feminism, LGBT movement, anti-racist movement, support to migrants, in order to uh, be concerned only, that the left must be concerned only by national working class people. And, which was, I, I, I 
stress that stress stressed sorry that point in the uh, interview in in the uh, in, uh, newspaper in germany it's a complete misunderstanding of my book because for me to to um, use the left to uh, be left wing and not to be right wing because if the left is right wing it's not the, anymore the left which means that it's the, if the left it doesn't does not take into account uh, the the poorer uh, people um, do not take into account the working class the unemployed the precarized uh, workers and so on uh, if the, the left doesn't take into account all these people which they have to uh, be concerned, uh, to, to, which they have to, to take into account, because it's the it's mission of the left to, to, to be concerned by and, and to defend the rights of the, of the working class and the, 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 the poorer people in society, uh, they will vote for the National Front uh, or for the IFD in Germany and so on. So if we, we have to revive uh, the left through the revival of a left-wing thought to the reinvention of the left-wing intellectual framework. This does not mean that I wanted to get rid of what the people in Germany call identity politics. I never use the word identity politics because for me it's not, uh, it's not about identity. It's about a social movement, social justice, social transformation, and the feminist movement is not an identity uh, politics movement. It's it's about women's rights, and which are endangered uh, today in in Poland, uh, in uh, uh, in uh, maybe in Italy, maybe in, uh, in not to mention the U.S. And so, uh, it's not about identity of women. It's about women's rights, women's. Uh, 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 w women's situation in in the society, and and for for me as a gay man, it's not about my identity. It's, it's about my rights. It's, it's about my my life, and so it's it's not my identity. It's my life, and I fought for the right to to marry for same uh, the, the, the the right for. Um, Same-sex marriage, sorry, sorry. and um, I fought for that, and uh, and we, we we won in France uh, at least. And um, but it's not about identity; uh, it's uh, it's about rights. It's about uh, um, the the possibility for people to build their life as they want to do, if they want, if they don't want, it's okay. Uh, and it's not about identity, but it's, it's, there is, in my view. There are several modes of domination, and no one of these modes of domination is more important than the others. And there are, you, you cannot think that there is the, 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 the principal uh, modes of domination and the secondary ones, and, uh, which, is, which was the, the, the communist or Stalinist way of thinking. Feminism was a, a kind of side, uh, 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 was a secondary uh, struggle. The main struggle was a class struggle. And if we have to revive the idea of the class confrontation, class struggle, class conflictuality, this does not mean that you have to erase from the land, political landscape the feminist movement, movements, because there is no one, not one feminist movement, but the whole one, uh, LGBT movement, anti-racist movement, because the very notion of class um, has to be transformed to uh, class is not uh, um, um, the working class is not the white man working in a factory. Working class is maybe a, um, a black woman working in the same factory or being um, um, uh, employed as a, a housemaid, as a, 
uh, cashier in the supermarket and so and so you you cannot define social class without what they call identity politics because we have to redefine the notion of class uh, as though there was working class without uh, um, uh, differences in, in this working class, but there are issues inside the working class between uh, races, uh, white and black, uh, gender, men and women, uh, uh, sexual uh, orientation, straight and, and gay or lesbians, and all these issues mixed up here to build a new notion of class. And, uh, of, uh, so it's not anymore the, the Marxist notion of class. You have to redefine this uh, notion of class in order to understand what are the, the issues in our society, what is at, at stake today in our society. If you, if you forget feminism, you forget a large part of the transformative movement in our societies. And if you want to build the left without feminism, it will not be the left, and you will lose a lot of votes, so it will not be the left, and it will not win uh, many votes, and uh, they will not win the election. So, uh, and for me, you know, I think that social movements are very important to transform society, to, to get more social justice. And uh, as um, I, I can, I can walk in the street of Paris with migrants to support them. I can walk at the Gay Pride March uh, uh, every month of June. I can uh, sign manifestos to support uh, women's rights when they are uh, under threat, I, and, and so on. Uh, I, can, I can be with a yellow vest when they are uh, subjected to uh, police uh, violence. And so I don't have to choose what, what, what I cannot do. I cannot be everywhere uh, every day, of course. But I don't want to choose which is the good movement, which is, uh, I want to be part of this protest movement, this uh, dissenting movement, this transformative movement. And so the discussion for what should be the left, what must be the left, must be um, uh, the, the first condition of a discussion on these issues is that you have to be more and more inclusive. And I, I wrote a piece in a, in a volume, uh, it was in a conference on Pierre Bourdieu, um, I wrote a piece about the absent voices. And I reflect, to, taking as a starting point a, a text by Pierre Bourdieu, I try to reflect on when we, you are in a part in a movement, you have always to ask yourself, who is not here? Your movement is doing something, which means that there are other people who are not here. Who are they? Why are they not here? And uh, what will we do if they come and claim that they do belong to uh, uh, this movement? And um, for example, the LGBT movement was, uh, first of all, uh, LG, lesbian and gay movement, then LGBT, transgender, and then transgender claimed their room in the, in the and they, 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 they wanted to be part of the movement. And so we have to welcome the, the people who want to be part of the movement and not to say, oh no, you don't belong. Uh, uh, your, 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 two, uh, um, your, your movement is not, uh, um, you, you are not numerous enough, you, uh, you don't be, uh, um, you're not part of that movement. Um, so the left must be the more, the most inclusive as uh, it can be. Yeah. My, my answers are long, but because your questions are difficult, you know. Oh. <laughs> Can I? 
Do you, want, do you have some questions before yes, the public? Yes, yes, yes. If I may. Um, I was wondering about this uh, writing, your writing from the position of a class renegade or transfuge de class. And um, as you write here, uh, as you write in your book, uh, it is when people write about working class, and they rarely do, it is to say that they left and that they are and they're glad that they left and it is always uh, by whereby like perpetrating per perpetuating this status of social illegitimacy and relegating those people to that and i was wondering like uh, how is it possible to like uh, denounce this status of social illegitimacy or legitimate working class culture, but without falling into the trap of glorifying this culture for what it is and um, what is at stake here? Uh, once again, it's a very, very, very <laughs> difficult question. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that easy to write about working class when you uh, betrayed your working class, when you escape from working class, because as I put it in the book, I write about my family, my social milieu, to give them a legitimacy in the, they, they are deprived of in the, in the cultural, intellectual, and political field. But while doing so, it's me who is writing about working class and not them, and I give them a legitimacy uh, uh, which, uh, uh, of which they are deprived of, but um, at the same time, I have to describe them as they are, um, uh, homophobic, uh, racist, and uh, and so on. So I don't I don't want to build a mythology of the working class, of the the kind of uh, Stalinist mythology of the working class, the working class hero and the working class uh, man or woman. Uh, uh, my mother, especially, was racist, obsessively racist, and I cannot. Um, I cannot uh, uh, lie about that. So if I give, if I want to write about the working class, which was my, my family, my social background, my social milieu, uh, to rehabilitate them in the political field, I write about them and deprive them of um, some uh, um, Oh, conditions of legitimacy because uh, if they are racist, if they are homophobic, the people will tell me, why do you want them to be uh, uh, a social movement important in the left if uh, they are all what we are fighting against? And in part, my parents were. So it's, 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 it's kind of a... Um, uh, we have to reflect on the difficulties of this. Uh, of, of politics is not uh, a, a, a set of simple issues, you know. Uh, you can be, we were discussing about May 68 before entering the room. Uh, in May 68, in France, in Paris, there were 10 millions of workers on strike, occupying their factories and so on. So you want to support them. But you have to know that some of the people, the strikers are racist, are homophobic, are misogynist, are uh, uh, someone be maybe beating their, their, their wives. Uh, and um, so you have to know that. So you support a strike, but that doesn't mean that you support the individuals which are involved in that strike. And there was, in May 68, a huge the search of a, of a very, very important and in, intense feminist movement at that time. When they went to the demonstration of the communist trade unions, they were expelled from the demonstration by the, 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 the workers' trade unions. So, May 68, you can say it, the 
10 million workers on strike, a feminist movement, the rise of a, a LGBT movement, uh, the ecological uh, concerns, and so, on, and so on. But this all together, this is May 68. But you have to know that it is a view on the landscape, but if you come closer in, you, people are fighting each other in the demonstration, sometimes physically and violently fighting each other in the demonstration. So you cannot think of um, the reunification, uh, the unification, and, uh, um, and you cannot ask as a condition for supporting of a movement that people are aware of all the other modes of domination, uh, not only aware of them, but uh, fighting against them. So it's um, here, um, uh, politics is, 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 uh, is the, the movements have their own definition, their different movement, their own specific de definition, their own history, the history of the working class, Movement is not the same as the, the history of the feminist movement, the history and of the LGBT movement, and so on. And each movement has its own temporality. And sometimes this temporality intersect with each other, as it was uh, in, it happened in May 68, but very, most often it does not happen. And the, 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 the fights, are led separately by women, by LGBT uh, people, by uh, working class, by uh, black people in the suburbs, and so So the intersection is a concept you can use, but in, in the actual uh, uh, struggles, uh, it doesn't work that way. It's a, uh, so the, to answer your question, to to give a legitimacy to uh, a working class in, in, the, in the intellectual discourse and in the political field does not mean that you uh, accept people as they are. But there is a wonderful sentence by Jean-Paul Sartre in was one of his texts in the, uh, one of his, his texts in the 70s, that before the workers uh, goes on strike, uh, the workers, the, the, the male, white, white male worker is uh, racist, is misogynist, but in the process of the strike, when the strike has begun, um, the solidarity will prevail um, between French workers and uh, immigrants, between men and women, and so the, the movements are also transformative. People are not the same before the movement, when the movement starts, and when the movement is at its uh, peak. The question is, does, do people get back to what they were before? when the strike or the movement is over, it's, it's, it's another question. But I do, I do believe in the transformative uh, power of uh, social movements. You're not the same when you are outside a movement, before a movement, and during the, the movement. So many people have been politicized by a strike, by a demonstration, and then they started changing and uh, they are not the same afterwards. I don't know if I answer your question. But <laughs> Thank you. We can uh, receive a few questions from the public if there is some. There are some. Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask you a few things about your understanding of class. Uh, while I was reading Retour à Rem and your other book, I think on French it's called um, La Société comme uh, Verdict. Uh, you, in, in German, Gesellschaft als Urteil. Als Urteil. I, I read the German translations because <laughs> I can't speak French, yeah. But um, 
uh, I noticed that uh, you were unlikely, not like Sartre, talking in ontological terms about class or about shame. You always pick the particular one, the particular shame, like gay shame, or the particular uh, identities which make a class, you know, like ethnical identities, professional identities, or uh, sexual identities, ethnical, yeah, and so on. And uh, do you think uh, that a class, can it be defined by one identity? Because my opinion is that a class uh, is constructed uh, by people being by people from different identities being forced, concentrated at one point. For example, my mother, she works in Germany, she's a foreigner, uh, she, she's in the working class in the, you know what I mean, uh, she's not very well paid and uh, she had to Especially leave. in Germany, working class yeah. people are not very well paid yeah. at all. Yeah, and unfortunately she's living in Munich and that's really a mess. Because <laughs> it's really expensive, yeah. And uh, I noticed that people working with my mother were mostly people with a migrational background, uh, which were oppressed because of their sexual background. You know, most of them, they are from the Balkans and uh, they no, don't even have a flat. Most of them are working, are living in, uh, in uh, rooms uh, which their uh, employers give them, yeah. And uh, I always thought you cannot define a class by one identity. A class is this construct, what I said, when much, much, when a lot of identities are forced to deal with one another at one point. So uh, that's how I read your books, because uh, is it what you wanted to tell? I, I, actually, I don't, as you said, I, I don't have an, an ontological view on class and uh, I don't have any ontology of class. Uh, class uh, is is uh, is uh, is a reality. There are people who are working class. Uh, there are people who are uh, workers. There are people who are uh, poor. But this does not define a class. To 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 define a class, you have to first of all to have a notion, a concept of class. Without a concept of class, there is no class. There are people who are poor, who are working class, but there is no uh, political uh, class in the in political sense of the term. Because we saw that in France, when the Communist Party nearly completely disappeared from the political sphere, landscape in France, uh, there were there were not any more a party claiming we are the party of the working class. So they were not any more a working class because they, uh, the working class does not exist without a discourse, without a notion, without a concept, and without a party, without a trade unions. And so uh, there are people who are workers, but so to, 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 to discuss the, 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 about working class, what is a working class? We have to, to define a notion of class. And um, you, you cannot have a very a simple notion of class. They are different. If you, if you mean the same position in the economic process, it's not true because uh, there are people who don't work in a factory uh, less and less now. And uh, what you, you what you describe your, about your mother is not the only possible definition of belonging to to a working class, because um, we have to think about there are people who don't work, unemployed people. I don't know in your country. I can tell you in mine. Um, there are a lot of people who are unemployed in Germany, in in uh, in Spain, in Italy. Uh, so. Unemployed people, how do you define them? 
belonging to the working class, oh, of course, in, in a way, but they don't, they, they, how, can they, how can they mobilize together if they don't work together in the same place? Because when you are unemployed, the definition of the unemployed that you don't work, so you don't have a workplace, and um, so you cannot organize with other people on the workplace uh, as it was. My mother, you, you, you were talking about your mother, we we'll talk about mine. My mother, I, I describe in uh, returning to us, I describe the, the factory in which my mother used to work in the 70s. And for the book I'm writing now, I research on that factory, and I discovered that when she was working in that factory, there were 1,700 workers, in the, men and women in the factory, 1,700. Uh, 1,700, okay. Uh, 500 were member of the Communist Trade Union, CGT, 500, which is, Incredible! It's it's a very very uh, strong, uh, powerful uh, group of workers organizing in a, in a, in the trade union. So they were they 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 started on strike, long and massive strikes, uh, uh, um, year after year. They, they were resisting oppression and uh, capitalist violence. The factory today is closed. It's still here. The, 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 the walls are still, the buildings are still, but it's closed. It's, so where are the workers? I don't know. They are dead, probably. But where are the membership cards of the trade union? If there is no factory anymore, there is no place to be together. There is no place to be member of a trade union. So people are isolated, and what is the way of resisting to the social order, to the capitalist violence? Probably to vote for the National Front. So do you define them as a working class? Um, they were working class. When, uh, the parents were working in that factory. This was a working class, an organized working class, fighting working class. But their children, isolated, separated from each other, uh, um, unable to organize because unemployed or f trying to find tempo temporary jobs, precarious jobs. Precarious jobs means also precarious lives because when you are, uh, uh, when your job is precarious, temporary, you fear for the future. What will happen tomorrow? What will happen next year? So if you don't have a future, a sense of the future, you will not mobilize, you will not organize, because you are afraid of what will happen. You, you, to, you have to feel secure to, in, in a way to organize, to, to, to fight. So, uh, but these people are still what we can define as a working class. If we try to build a notion of working class, which includes different people, no matter what are their um, jobs, kind of their job, their uh, uh, um, the country of origins, their, their race, their, their, uh, and so on. So the notion of working class here is not to be in the same workplace, because there are people who are not in the same workplace. And um, how could they organize? Maybe here, a party or an association which would organize the unorganized people because they are unemployed uh, would be something very, very uh, uh, relevant and important to, to redefine uh, the notion of class and the notion of class struggle and the notion of the left. So uh, it's not that I don't have an ontological concept of class because I don't have an ontology of class because uh, there is no uh, simple uh, definition of class. Uh, uh, um, 
economy is uh, transforming itself uh, through neoliberalism, neoliberalism agenda. Uh, um, people were civil servants in the public sector in France, which were um, whose work were not temporary. These were permanent jobs are now under threat, thanks to our wonderful uh, Emmanuel Macron and the works. The, the, the position of the civil servant will become what is a, a temporary contract. Uh, uh, will become temporary. So um, all these people are under threat of the violence of uh, the neoliberal uh, agenda uh, that our governments are trying to achieve. So we have to rebuild the notion of class which can take into account all these people, and uh, I know it's, uh, I will not do that uh, alone, <laughs> we have to, 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 to do that together. It seems to me that we have not only to rebuild the notion of class, but the notion, uh, or to redefine the notion of class consciousness in Marxist term. Yes, and, uh, but you know, class consciousness has to be redefined too because uh, it's maybe sometimes it's not consciousness which defines class. And uh, I, I'm afraid that some some people who identify themselves as working class uh, do not identify themselves as less left wing, for example. And uh, you can have people who are uh, right wing saying we are the working class, we are, um, or the notion of the people that uh, some um, uh, left, uh, not left wing uh, movement today try to uh, to use to replace the notion of left uh, oppo as opposed to the right, and so uh, class consciousness is is. Um, If I think of my family, they have a class consciousness, but it was uh, not permanent. Sometimes they, 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 they did forget that they were working class, not as um, in, in, in their daily life, but in, in the political way of seeing the world. And uh, what is there? Is there a link between being working class and having a working class conscious a class consciousness? There is one class if we if we discuss the issue of class consciousness. There is one class today who has a very 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 strong class uh, uh, consciousness, which is the bourgeoisie, and uh, which is defending their interest. Which is fighting to 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 up, to obtain uh, tax cuts from uh, our government, which they, which Emmanuel Macron did. His first uh, decision was to cut taxes for the richest people, and uh, with the silly idea of the trickle down theory that if you give money to the rich, they will invest it invest it in the economy. And sometimes, we, we never know when, but sometimes in the future, it will benefit to everybody, which never happened, of course, which never happens. And uh, a friend of mine uh, described that uh, inverted Robin Hood. Uh, you take money from the poor to give it to the rich, because if you give money to the rich, you have to find the money to give them. So you raise taxes for the poor, you raise taxes for the retirees, you suppress grants for the students, you suppress uh, positions in the hospital, in the education, and in the uh, public sector. So here there is a, a social violence, incredible social violence, because of the class consciousness of the bourgeoisie, who 
bourgeois people want to get more and more money, which they do, and the inequalities are increasing uh, uh, year after year, and uh, uh, the richer people are richer and richer every year, and the poorer are are poorer and poorer, especially in Germany, for example, the, what we, we call the uh, working poor people, uh, as you said about your, your mother, people work, but they cannot um, uh, pay the rent of an apartment, uh, so they cannot feed their children. So uh, here, uh, the class consciousness, unfortunately, is not on the side of the destitute. The class consciousness is on, on the side of, uh, there is a class conscious of itself and defending his own interest, fighting very hard for their interest. Unfortunately, it's not the working class, it's not the, the, the poor, it's not uh, um, uh, the, 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 bourgeois, the bourgeoisie do, does it. And you understand the Yellow Vest movement, for example, as a new kind of class consciousness. It's not the traditional definition of class, but all these people who gather together week after week to say, we don't stand anymore that situation, it's a kind of class consciousness because they feel um, um, uh, and, uh, uh, badly treated by the by the the government. So you're right. We have to to redefine the notion of class, but the notion of class consciousness. But the notion of class consciousness is is, is it, as the notion of class is is not a simple one uh, either. The the very last question, if there is one. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, um, what were, what do you think would be some perspective for the LGBT movement today, like concretely what we are supposed to fight for, because you mentioned the... So, sorry, I, can, can you speak in the, in the, the microphone? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, like some concrete examples of what we are actually supposed to fight, fight for as queer people, because you mentioned uh, marriage. But um, I don't know, from another perspective, for example, as a Marxist uh, queer theoretic Peter Drucker said, uh, he examined um, the queer movement and queer communities under neoliberalism. And he said that as some groups of queer people, like middle class people or people who had some other sorts of capital, like I don't know, social capital and so on, won certain rights for themselves. At the same time, poverty was being criminalized and uh, poor queer people who, were not, who did not have the means to conform to what he calls gay normality were basically left to rot. And um, so my question is, do we need, on the other hand, a more um, class conscious LGBT movement? Uh, it's a difficult question too. Um, uh, you know, when you fight for something, for some right, it's obvious that you will not uh, um, address all the issues which are at stake in society. If you fight for the right um, to abort for women, um, there will be people who are poor and uh, um, it doesn't um, prevent you to fight for this right because it's important to, to do it and to, to keep fighting when this right is, uh, is uh, uh, threatened by the right-wing governments and the right-wing uh, forces. What, what I saw, I don't, I don't know for other, what I saw in my own country, um, the struggle for gay, for same-sex marriage, uh, which has been labeled by some so-called radicals or uh, radical queer people, activists, as conformist, normative. I saw that half a million people uh, demonstrating 
demonstrated in the streets of Paris month after month during two years to oppose this right. And I was wondering if it is that confirmist, why are, are all those people demonstrating, shouting insult, incredible insult? You cannot, it was frightening to, to listen to, the, uh, they, they were in the street everywhere in Paris. Um, shouting insults against okay, faggots, against okay, dykes, okay, uh, um, or, or you put them to the bonfires, and, and so on. It, it was frightening. Half a million in the street of Paris, months after months. So there was something which was here being transformed in society. And it was more, I would say, transformative, I would say more subversive than an abstract idea of subversion or radicality, which I do like, I'm, I like subversion, I like radicality, but I also know that to talk about radicality and subversion very often does not subvert anything because subversion is to have an object. You subvert something, or if you don't subvert something, you don't subvert subvert anything, so you don't subvert at all. And the subversion of the norms of marriage, the, what, what counts as a family, who, is, who has the legitimacy of being a family, being recognized legally as a family to have children. And the images, it, for younger people to see images of gay, lesbian couples, gay and lesbian families, gay and lesbian it's something which is, trans it's, it's, a, it's a huge transformation, much more than the ritual denunciation of normativity. And no, nobody has to get married, you know, it's, it's a right you, you, you get, as nobody has to abort, if you, if you want to do, you do, if you don't want, you don't. And I, I know that, um, I don't see why, why, I don't see the point of uh, uh, linking these uh, social transformation to neoliberalism. Because as, as a French intellectual in, in my country, I go to demonstration with uh, migrants I go to demonstration against police violence. I go to the, I march at the gay pride. And I don't want to oppose all these movements. I can be part, but I know that uh, if I do one thing, I know I will, if I fight for gay marriage against all these reactionary forces massively demonstrating in the streets of Paris, I know that I will not change the economic situation of migrants, of poor people, except that, for example, a lot of migrants can get citizenship through marriage, which in same-sex couple, of which the, the possibility they were deprived of if there were not uh, this possibility of getting married in a same-sex uh, couple. So, here, the economic issue is also at stake because um, if you are poor and you're, you can benefit the social security of, uh, or the pension of your partner, uh, um, it helps poor people. If you are a migrant and you can get citizenship through same-sex marriage, it helps migrants. So it's not only a uh, petit bourgeois uh, claim that uh, some people, uh, working class people, uh, want to, and transgender people want to, a lot of them, want to be able to get married. It's, it's a complex issue, uh, transgenderism, to get married. If you don't have the right to marry someone of the same sex, um, imagine if, uh, uh, well, okay, you, you understand what I, what I mean. I, in English, at that time, I will not be able to, to explain. But, but uh, for me, um, it, 
same-sex marriage has contributed to undo the social norms. The more traditional, the more violent social norms, which was uh, uh, the definition of marriage as an institution linking, relating a man to a woman and uh, to have children. And now this, this very central institution has been completely subverted by uh, 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 these new possibilities open to uh, uh, same-sex couples. So I see here that the heroes, if we have to redefine the notion, the notion of subversion and the notion of, uh, of normativity have to be redefined too. And I think that there is in the queer movement a kind of normativity, uh, of the non-normativity. You have to be non-normative, but sometimes to be non-normative is a new norm. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I w what I want to, to build as a framework is the possibility, more possibilities to more people, and which means you don't have to judge what people want to do. You have to help them to be, to be able to live their lives as they want uh, to, to, to do. Sorry, I have lost, lost my voice. Um, okay, that would be all for tonight. Uh, you can tomorrow at 7 o'clock uh, speak with um, Didier. There will be more time because we will start earlier tomorrow. And, uh, <laughs> yes, so uh, I invite you to come tomorrow first at 6 o'clock when we will present the books of Edouard Louis which were inspired by uh, re returning uh, to Rams. And then after that, uh, with uh, Edouard and with uh, Didier again. So thank you very much for coming and see you tomorrow. <laughs>